Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I've decided that I'm going to take a little break from doing the uh, typical vocal analysis of a rock singer kind of deal. What I've decided to do today is go back and make sort of an actual training video, a teaching video. I know that I've done a lot of teaching throughout the analyses that I've done, but it's been a while. It's been a couple of months since I actually, you know, did a video on subjects about the voice. This is going to be more like classroom style. So I made a PowerPoint and everything that we can go through and just to kind of give some general points. So I know that this may not be what some of you have expected. And I have plenty of content available to do analyses of singers. But I don't want that to get stale. I don't want that to become too predictable. You know, I, I want to give you guys something fresh and new every now and then. And some of you haven't been around this channel long enough to kind of see some of the older videos. And now that I got a little bit better quality and that kind of thing, maybe I can do something a little better than what I'd done before. So what I decided to do the video on today is a subject that I think everyone can benefit from. And it's on, not only is it going to be, I think, instructive to some of you who are aspiring singers, I think it's also going to give some of you who aren't singers, kind of some insight into what I listen for when I do these analyses. Now, if you are a singer out there, you kind of already know some of these things I'm going to talk about. You sort of know the deal, but this is probably going to at least give you some new ideas to think about to some extent. Um, and I want to kind of tell you all that, you know, the subject of the video is top five bad habits that untrained singers have. And the way I come to this conclusion, it's not like there's some empirical data that says these are the top five. I just put top five based upon me teaching. I've had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of students in various forms over the years. And I've studied lots of voices. When I was in college, we had recital labs and we had studio environments where we had to analyze singers and that kind of thing, like our peers and our coworkers. And so I kind of learned how to analyze singers and through this uh, when like for example when new people would come in to college as freshmen they'd all have these really common traits because they didn't have a lot of training and in my studio that I work right now same thing a lot of new voices new singers come in and they have these really common bad habits and I've kind of listed this anecdotally based upon the types of things that I've found that I see the most so maybe that'll sort of give you some background and usually if you know this is like my checklist when I get a new student like in my mind I'm thinking okay these are the things that I'm looking for and these are probably going to be some issues that they have starting out so I'm guessing that if you're a singer and you haven't really had any formal training and maybe if you have had some training, these are going to be some of the kinds of things that you've run into, you either heard about or issues that you may find that you have yourself. So I'm going to just go through it one bullet point at a time. Hopefully if the PowerPoint works, this thing's been acting really funky. And if it just makes everything go through at once, then I'll just address each, each one point by point. So here we go. I hope you guys enjoy this. This is the top five bad habits that untrained singers have. Number five, poor vocal hygiene. Now, when I say hygiene, I don't mean like taking a bath, putting on deodorant, brushing your teeth. It's a totally different kind of hygiene that I'm referring to when it comes to vocalization and singing. Uh, vocal hygiene specifically refers to the way that you maintain and keep up with your voice. Uh, I think I've mentioned this maybe in one of my live streams. Uh, I don't remember. But there was one point where I mentioned Placido Domingo where there's this famous anecdote where he... Um, was rehearsing for an opera that he was performing the next week and he had to sing a tenor C. And when it would get to the point during the rehearsal, Domingo would just stop singing. And finally, like it was, I think two nights before uh, the show it was like one of their final dress rehearsals. He just wouldn't sing the C when it came to that point. And the conductor turned and said, Placido, where is your high C? And Placido responded by saying, Maestro, I will give you your high C. Would you like it tonight? Or would you like it the night of the performance. And so that little anecdote, it's kind of passed around among singers and in, in the professional realm and in the academic realm. It may be true, it may not be true, but either way, it speaks to a very important point. Maintaining your voice is far more than half the battle of being a consistent, sustainable singer. So here are some examples of poor vocal hygiene. One, eating poorly, and specifically things that are super, super greasy. People have asked me, like, does weight have a bearing on the health of your voice? And I would say no, mostly because there have been so many examples of singers that are kind of bigger, heavier, that have been fantastic. Uh, I mean, just in, just males that come off the top of my head, like Pavarotti. Pavarotti was a big guy, really big guy, and he was probably, well, definitely the greatest tenor of the past at least 100 years, technically speaking. He was just absolutely perfect, and so he was overweight, and it didn't make any difference at all. Uh, Bryn Terrifold is one of my favorite baritones. He's a kind of a stocky guy. I'm kind of a stocky guy. 
and I mean, so your weight necessarily doesn't have that much to do with with the hygiene and the health of your voice, but what you eat does because your metabolism is ultimately what is the the biggest actor on the way that your body functions. Now, I am not a biologist. I am not like a life scientist. Like I don't study the function of the of homeostasis and the way that the body metabolizes things. So if you are, and I misquote something or I say something incorrectly, please feel free to correct me in the comments. I'm doing the best that I can with the limited terminology that I have on the subject. So eating poorly, generally it's just better to eat clean foods. It, just a good balanced, healthy diet is a good way to maintain your vocal hygiene. Typically you don't want to drink a lot of like lactose type things before you sing. Um, they say that what you drink the day before determines how you're going to feel the next day. So obviously things like alcohol, drinking alcohol is bad for you when you sing because it's a dehydrant, pulls water away from your body. Um, greasy foods or just slow everything down. It's, you could gum up your voice, just make things feel really heavy when you sing. So those are just, that's just one, you know, general sort of concept about the things you eat. But that leads directly into the concept of hydration. If you don't hydrate properly, your body is going to go into dehydration mode. Even if you're totally fine, you feel like you're totally okay. If your body isn't getting the kind of water that it knows that it needs to supply to the rest of your body, it just goes into dehydration mode and it starts sending water water to different vital organs, the body has sort of this system of hierarchy and priority that it distributes necessary things to, to survive. And unfortunately, the voice isn't high on that totem pole. So when the body needs water, it kind of pulls water away from here. And the, the hallmark sign of that is if you don't drink water, you get a dry throat. You get a dry mouth. The reason is your body's saying, well, I'm dehydrated. I got to make sure the most important things, my heart, my stomach, all these things that I've got to have to function have water in them. So if you don't hydrate properly, your body will not get the water that it needs to be able to justify supplying that extra moisture and hydration to the throat. So hydration is super, super important and poor vocal hygiene and poor hydration go hand in hand. So the next is bad speaking habits. What do I mean by this? So I've discussed in previous videos about fundamental frequency and the fundamental frequency is if you are speaking in a completely natural and by natural, I mean unimpeded, just speaking as you normally would without trying to change things that you're going to be able to average out the pitches that you speak at. and. If you do an average over a, you know, a series of words, that average frequency is probably your fundamental frequency or the, the point where your voice most commonly is used in the, in the frequency spectrum. And we can determine your voice type through that and you know all those kinds of things. So your fundamental frequency is really, really important to understand. It's important to be speaking around where your fundamental frequency is. And there are ways that you can test whether or not you're above or below your fundamental frequency. So if you ever have any concern about whether or not you're speaking at the proper fundamental frequency, you can always go to a voice therapist and there are tests that they can do to determine how far off you are from that fundamental frequency. I did that myself when I had my vocal injury in college and, and they determined that I was speaking like way below my fundamental frequency. I was talking like way down here a lot and it was just, it wasn't good for my voice and it was causing my voice to work a lot harder. But what was actually happening is I was fatigued because I was over singing. I was singing far too much and my voice just got tired, so it just got lazy, and it just kind of put everything down here to sort of take some of the weight off of the, the effort of me having to you know, speak in a, in a normal place. It was just tired. So bad speaking habits can actually lead to the same kind of vocal injuries that bad singing habits can. So if you ever have a question about that, go to a voice therapist or an otolaryngologist, and they can kind of tell you some more about that. Using your voice too much is another common hallmark of poor vocal hygiene. And I, what I mean by that is my uh, voice teacher in college called it the three twos. They were too loud, too long, and too aggressively. So if you use your voice too loud, louder than normally, like screaming at a concert, so that, you know, because you're cheering for your favorite band or at a football game or whatever, because you're screaming for your team too long, using your voice for longer than your muscles can sustain it. Uh, and too aggressively, like you are being too forceful with it, trying to make things happen that are like push, use a lot of push and use a lot of force. Those, those are the three twos. And so those three twos are the hallmark examples of how you can use your voice 
too much. So those are very common things that I see unrelated to necessarily the way they sing, but just general vocal hygiene when people come to me and they don't have a lot of training. Number four is poor breath support. Now I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I have a video already on breath support, breathing in the diaphragm. Granted, it's a little older and the quality is probably not quite as good. Uh, you can still go back and watch it. It does a, a pretty decent job, I think, of breaking down the breathing mechanism and, and how it all works and, and how the support structures engage and those kinds of things. So if you can find it in my video list, I would definitely watch it. Uh, but poor breath support is an extremely common problem that I run into with, with untrained singers. Other than like not breathing properly, the other uh, manifestation that I see of people's poor breath usage is they use too much air when they phonate. And I've talked about this covered sound before where you'll talk or you'll sing and it'll be like this. And there's a lot of extra air going through. And what basically the downside of this, what this basically does is when the folds vibrate, when they, when they naturally vibrate, the folds have to close to make a sound. So when the folds close, the vibration occurs naturally and you have the normal speaking sound like what you hear right now. And when there's extra air being pushed through, the folds don't fully close as much. And so when they don't close as much, they have, kind of have to take certain points wherever they can grab onto another to phonate. So instead of having this even vibration, you kind of get this spotty kind of like touching of the folds all over the place. And ultimately what that does is it puts too much pressure and strain on individual parts of the folds that should be distributing the vibration evenly across the folds. And eventually that can cause things like ruptures or polyps or nodules over time. Doing it a little bit isn't a huge, huge deal, but if it's something that becomes habitual, you will definitely get nodules. Like you think of singers like Adele and John Mayer, like those are the two names that come to mind that have had major vocal issues from singing in a covered sound. Next up is poor onsets at number three. So onsets are kind of referred to in, a, in multiple different ways by the singing community. Some people, I, I don't, I don't know how they come up with these alternate terms, but you'll hear two different schools of thought about the the verbiage that you use for these. I'm just going to use the ones that I learned and I kind of put in parentheses some some other possible words in case you're a voice student and you've heard these referred to in a different way. These are the words that I've learned and if yours are different then just, you know, coordinate this in your mind accordingly. The onset is the way that the voice approaches phonating or making sound when a word begins with a vowel. For example, the word onset, right? Onset as an onset because it starts with the letter O. So anything that starts with A, E, I, O, or U will have an onset at the beginning of it. Because typically when you speak or when you sing, you have a plosive sound like P, B, or something like that. You'll have some kind of articulated sound like a T or G. And so by taking that off, the voice has to engage with a sound immediately rather than a plosive. So if you have a word like onset, you start right out with a ah, 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 onset. So you don't get to set that up with any other kind of sound. The way that you approach this is vitally important to your vocal health. The reason is that every time you create an onset, the folds and the air are trying to coordinate in the timing of the passage of the air and the engagement of the vibration. So the way that you approach the onset determines what the folds are actually doing. And so to simplify that a little bit, we have three different types of onsets. We have the aspirate onset, we have the glottal onset, and the modal onset. And like I said, glottal and modal, I've heard hard glottal and soft glottal. I, I think that's a little bit confusing because it kind of gets the like it puts two terms in the same sort of ballpark i, I don't know I, I like having three distinctive terms so i can clearly define them so your aspirate onset is if you start a word with a vowel but you put air through at the same time so what actually happens is the air pushes through before the folds close and engage so if i said the word onset with an aspirate onset i'd go onset it almost have like an h in front of it but you can hear the onset, onset, like that. So when you push air through with an aspirate onset, it's not the end of the world as long as you don't do it too much. And then it becomes like the covered thing where you're pushing too much air through and you're trying to, you know, close the folds. 
Um, the bigger downside to the aspirate onset is that when you push air through, you're using air that you've got stored inside. So all of a sudden it's going to be harder for you to maintain phrases and it's going to be harder for you to sing as effectively because all that breath support that you've got from the breathing that you did kind of just gets pushed right back out and expelled back out. So you don't want to do that if the goal is to maintain good breath support. So aspirate onsets can kind of inhibit that a little bit. The second is the glottal onset, or some people call the hard glottal. And the hard glottal or the glottal onset is definitely the most damaging because what happens is the folds are expecting air to come through and they engage like the air is coming through, but there's no air there yet. So you get this uh, uh, almost like a coughing sound uh, onset, right? So if I said onset, it would uh, onset, onset. So there's that pop. That's extremely bad for you because when there's no air coming through to make, you know, along with the vibration, the folds engage, they try to close, and what makes them vibrate, the air pushing through that causes them to vibrate, isn't there. So they just kind of boom, boom, boom. And if you do that over and over again, calluses end up developing around the points of the folds where they touch because they're not supposed to take that kind of like brunt collision. They're not supposed to take that kind of force against one another. So one of the most common things that I hear in nearly every singer I listen to in recorded music, live music, new singers, untrained singers, is these glottal onsets. And I don't know what causes it to develop. I'm sure that I did it too uh, when I was first, before I you know got training and first developing as a singer, I'm sure I did it too. I don't know what causes us to do it. There are some languages that require you to use a little bit of glottal onset when you speak or when you sing it, and periodically it's okay. You know, doing a glottal onset once a day, it's not going to destroy your voice. You're not going to, you know, be damaged forever because you use a couple of glottal onsets. But if you make a habit out of it and you like a recording using them all the time and you sing all the time using glottal onsets every time you approach vowels, you are definitely going to cause vocal damage. And it's one of the first things that I work on with my students to kind of work out of their voices. So I see it all the time. For untrained singers so that's a big one now the modal onset is what you are looking for the modal onset is where the folds and the air hit at the same time they connect so if i said the word onset if you listen it's almost like the vowel pops out of thin air onset onset there's no onset and there's no onset it's just onset it just appears that's your modal onset and it's something that you can train and it's something that you can develop uh, there are some pretty simple exercises you don't even have to move pitches around you can literally just go like e e a o u you can just do that you don't have to really sing it just pick a pitch and start out those vowels and listen to the way that you begin them and if if you go back and record it or something you can hear uh, at the beginning of it, you did a glottal. And if you hear a uh, at the beginning of it, you did an aspirate. So that's a really simple way to sort of give yourself some guide points on how to develop your onsets without even having to take any lessons or anything like that. So maybe that'll help you if that if you do have that kind of problem. Number two, too much tension. And I've talked about this with basically every singer that I've analyzed. The problem with tension is that it causes muscles to engage in the mechanism that don't need to. Singing is a very free thing. Singing is not something that causes your body to well up with tension. It shouldn't anyway. There's no need for it to because all you're doing is targeting your speaking to a specific pitch. When you speak, you don't tense everything up. You don't tense up your neck. You don't tense up your shoulders when you talk because it makes everything sound strange and it makes everything sound off and it sounds like you're forcing things. Singing is virtually the same. If you don't have tension when you speak, you shouldn't have tension when you sing. There are just a very specific subset of muscles that cause the engagement of the vocal mechanism. And by overworking the muscles around it, when the voice actually needs to use them for specific reasons, they're going to be tired already. And that's one of the uh, most common traits in people who develop MTD or muscle tension dysphonia is the engagement of the outer muscles has been so aggressive that they're so fatigued that the voice gets tired just when it engages in a normal speaking way. People who developed MTD actually tend to have a lot of trouble even speaking. So tension is a huge thing. And I understand that that part of being expressive is like, you know, like making faces and like like really engaging your body in it, but you can still do all those things without 
tensing up. So here are the biggest forms of tension that singers tend to have. Number one is forehead tension. That's where you see this like furrowed up sort of thing. And it's probably the least damaging of the tensions. But the problem with it is that if you start up really tense up here, you're going to feel it in your cheeks. And by feeling it in your cheeks, your cheeks get tight. Then all of a sudden, the, the cheeks are connected to the same muscles that shape the lips and the jaw. So then your embouchures and your vowel shapings get messed up. So if you're really tense, then it might be hard for you to create a certain vowel sound that you're trying to create. So forehead tension isn't the worst thing in the world, but it will have a ripple effect on other elements of your singing. Second up is jaw tension. The jaw tension is when it, it can be caused by several things. It can be caused by the neck tightening up, which is what we're going to get to in a minute. Or it could be from you like stuffing your tongue in a weird place in your mouth. If you speak naturally, you pay attention to how your tongue moves. There is a sort of normal placement of your tongue for everything that you say. You don't consciously think about it. The tongue just sort of places itself where it needs to to make the sound that it makes. So... When you sing, it shouldn't be any different. You shouldn't be stuffing your tongue in weird places in your mouth just to make it sound like. I've seen singers that do stuff like use their tongue like this when they sing. And like that's just completely unnecessary because if you do that, you, you can feel the back end of your mouth tighten up just to be able to put your tongue there. And I, it, just, it just doesn't seem necessary. I, I've never understood how that kind of thing is beneficial. And most of the time, if I tell people to do that kind of thing to, hey, just let your tongue lie naturally, their sound is just as good, if not better. It sounds clearer. So a lot of times jaw tension is a byproduct of the tongue being placed poorly. Sometimes the jaw is tense because the neck is tense. So if the, if the, and that's what we're getting to next. If the neck is tightened up, you can feel tension underneath the jaw. Neck tension is particularly bad because it's the area surrounding the voice box. It's the area surrounding the larynx and the pharynx and the trachea and all these things that are vital and the folds themselves. These things are like of vital importance to the vocal tract and the singing mechanism. So if they're super tight, it's gonna be hard for you to move your larynx, lower it, do whatever you need to, to make the vocal tract be in its proper shape to create a phrase, because everything's stiff and locked in because all the muscles are engaged. If the external muscles end up wearing out, then the internal muscles, like I mentioned before, have nothing to fall back on if they need engagement from the outside. So if you're always super tight, then when you go to sing something that actually requires that engagement, you could overexert yourself, you can strain yourself, all sorts of things. And a lot of times neck tension also leads to extremely high placement of the larynx, which if you watched my videos before, you know that laryngeal placement is super important to the function of the voice and how much pressure is actually put on the folds to work. The smaller the space you have in this section of your, of your head and of your mouth and of your throat, the less that the sound that you create from your folds can resonate. And so the less that it can resonate, the more work the, the entire mechanism has to do to project and make things louder. So if you tighten your neck up, you can't move your vocal tract as much. Your body's going to have to force things and push things to be able to project in the same way that if you were loose. It sounds strange, but the most free, the, you get the most freedom when you don't control things. And it sounds completely contradictory, but the less control you use of the stuff around your voice, the freer the sound will be and the freer the singing will be. It's wild, but that's just how it is. And a back and shoulder tension um, is more of a posture related thing. Like typically people who have like really bad posture, you know, they, they like are bent over, you know, what'll happen is they get really sore in their backs and their shoulders and they have to compensate for it by poor, like tightening up their neck or getting really top heavy in their breathing. Also, um, a lot of back and shoulder tension can affect the efficiency of the breathing mechanism, depending on the, where the, the attention is coming from and how your back is placed and things like that. So I, I would say I listed it on here. The neck tension is definitely the most damaging to the mechanism. The jaw tension is probably the second most damaging because it tends to be hand in hand with the neck tension. And then forehead tension is probably the least damaging. It's, you don't, it's not a something you want to just say like, oh, well, it's the least damaging, so I'm gonna tighten up my forehead. It's still something you should avoid. And then the back and shoulder tension, I wouldn't say is super damaging necessarily, but it is gonna lead to making everything above it more difficult, which could lead to damage. So, you know, that kind of gives you a rundown of that. And here is time for number one. And this is gonna be the one that I think some of you might take issue with, but here it is. 
trying to imitate other singers. I could make an entire video on this subject alone, but we're already pretty long into this one and I, I don't want to go too far with it, but this is such a super important point that you all have to understand. Everyone's makeup of their voice is different. Everybody has a slightly different configuration going on inside their throat. It's why everyone's voice sounds different. Even though you might find two people who sound slightly similar when they talk or sing, there's still distinctive qualities that make them sound different. And the reason is that they have a different makeup inside of what's going on in their bodies. No two voices are alike. And as a byproduct of that, there is no way that you can successfully imitate or emulate what someone else is doing. You can try to make things sound similar, but you will not sound like them no matter what you do because you can't. It's the same reason that if I took uh, 10 of my friends and I put them all behind a door and I had all of them speak one at a time, I could distinguish who was speaking just by listening to them talk. We all have different fundamental makeups of the voice, and it's something that we should not shy away from we should embrace because being able to really hone that specific makeup of, of, of your own voice is what makes your instrument distinctive we're at a great advantage as singers in that we all have different instruments just because because i'm a bass baritone and there are other bass baritones does not mean that there's any other bass baritone in the world that's going to produce the same sound that my instrument does so I embrace that and I like that and I accept that. It means that I'll never be James Labrie. I could falsetto an F sharp, but I'm never going to be like belting out F sharps. My voice doesn't do that. So I have to accept myself for what it does do and hone in on that and do the best that I can with it. That's the overarching point that I'm going to get to with all of this. But imitating other singers is denying your own vocal makeup, which is you're denying yourself. What's the point? If you're just if you're not going to accept yourself for who you are and what you have, what's the point? Why try to be what someone else has already been? Everyone's fundamental frequencies and therefore your tessitura are different. And so we've talked about tessitura in other videos. We've had this discussion. The tessitura is kind of like the average range of your, where something seats when you sing. So if someone likes to sing around a B, that means that typically they'll find pieces that sit around that B range. Like my tessitura that I'm most comfortable at is usually around a G on the bass clef, G and A on the bass clef. Those are my sweet spots. So I really like singing around those pitches. Uh, fundamental frequency, which I've talked about a little bit before, is, is that point where your voice kind of meets that middle where it naturally wants to speak and resonate when you speak. Everyone's just a little bit different. Even if you took two bass baritones, you analyze their fundamental frequencies, we might have very similar, but mine might be one hertz higher than the other guys. Everybody's different. Hopefully I've gotten that point across by now. Another super important element of this is that if you try to imitate another singer and you're unaware of which vocal habits are good and bad, by taking on their traits, you will also inherit the same bad habits that they have. So by imitating other singers, all you're doing is setting yourself up to have the same vocal issues that those people do. And you probably will never sound like them because you don't have the same voice. When I teach students, my goal is to have them work on finding their own voice and honing it. Any voice type can fit into any genre of music if it's done correctly. Now, of course, some people would argue baritones can't sing metal because it doesn't fit in the mix. And I get it because I'm a baritone and I know what it's like to try and record. And when you record in a mix full of guitars and bass guitars, everything's really muddy. And so you have to have a really good producer that can bring that baritone sound out of the mix. And I, I get that. I understand it. So I have to accept those limitations, but I also am totally okay with honing myself. So that leads directly into this final point that this is more subjective. And, and what I mean by that is that this is something that some people may disagree with, and, and this is more an opinion of, of mine. So if you disagree with that, that's okay. I don't think that you're being yourself musically if you try to emulate what someone else does. If you are trying to sound like another singer, you are saying that what I bring to the table is not as good as what this person brings to the table. When I think the better way to do it is focus on what you bring to the table, hone it, make it as good as it can be. And if you turn out sounding like Adele, then that's great. If you don't, that's okay too. Be who you are. The idea is to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. My voice teacher, Dr. William Hobbins, always told me, you are the best Zach Ansley that the world has ever seen and the world will ever know. And that always really stuck with me because it was true. Like, 
I'm not saying I'm great, grand, glorious, amazing, but there's no one else who ever be what I am as a singer. And I will never be anyone else's singer. So there's no reason for me not to just focus on that in myself. And so by imitating other singers, I think you're doing yourself a disservice in your technique and you're doing yourself a disservice in terms of your own development as a singer and as a person and as an honest, true to yourself musician. So hopefully that little list gives you guys some insight as to the kind of things that I look for and the kind of things that you should look for if you don't have training when you go to get, you know, get voice help or when you're looking at your own singing, analyzing your own singing. If you ever have a voice teacher that tells you to follow some of these traits, I can promise you that they're probably not in your best interest because all the things that I've talked about here are kind of ideas that the scientific academic singing community have agreed upon as being bad for you. And on that note, uh, I wanted to bring up a side point before I before I go for the day. Someone made a comment and I've been I, I read all you guys' comments and and whether I respond or not isn't because I don't want to. It's just that if I spent if I if I responded to a thousand comments, I'd never get to do anything. So it's hard for me to respond to everything. But I did have one person who commented on my videos like questioning my qualifications and questioning my ability to analyze this stuff and like how can I make these judgments on this and that and this and that. And I kind of wanted to clarify this because this goes right in line with this whole academic scientific thing. Most of my study comes from my voice teacher when I went to college, Dr. William Hobbins, who has a PhD in vocal music education. He studied under a lady named Barbara Dosher, who basically literally wrote the book on vocal pedagogy. If you ever want to look up Barbara Dosher, she's dead now, but she wrote multiple pedagogy books. Uh, and she was a pioneer of understanding the science of the voice so those are my main, that's like my main background for my own personal research. My understanding comes from NATS, the National Association of Teachers of Singing. And they are a, an American organization of music teachers, singing teachers that have kind of made a coalition and they do peer review. They do journal articles. They do scientific studies on the voice to better understand the best, healthiest, most sustainable ways to use a singing mechanism. I would encourage all of you to go to nats.org. I'm going to put it in the video. Nats.org. Go there and look for the journal of singing and read to your heart's content. And I assure you that essentially everything that I speak of in my videos is going to be brought up in some journal article somewhere in Nats's website. And they are the premier group of scientific vocal analysts in the United States. So other than like specific researchers at colleges, they are the definitive resource for vocal pedagogy and understanding vocal health and vocal hygiene. So that's where everything comes from when I give you guys these ideas. I'm not just making this stuff up. I don't just say what I think sounds good and knock singers that, that I think have bad technique because I'm on my, you know, high and mighty throne. It's not like that. I take pride in my students getting better and seeing them perform because I'm just not that much of a performer. I never have been. I'll sing for crowds every now and then. I just, I don't enjoy it like some people do. And so I take great pride and pleasure in helping other people improve. And that's why I'm a teacher. So I don't do this with the intention of making myself seem better than someone else or smarter than someone else. I do this because I love it and because I genuinely want to help people. So you can rest assured if you do this research, like I'm asking, if you look at the things that I've said and you back it up with, you know, go look at, at some of this scientific research that we have, you'll find that it all kind of corroborates. And so that's where this whole video, this whole concept, this whole channel comes from. That's the basis of all of this. So maybe that helps clarify some things for some of you as well. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was a little bit off the beaten path. I know that we've uh, been doing a lot of vocal analysis of singers, and we will get back to that next week. I just want to take a week off from that and do something a little bit different and give you guys something different to cogitate and to think on. And hopefully this will also give you a different point of reference going forward for my analysis videos. And maybe you can start using your own critical listening skills and start hearing some of these things on your own and you won't need me anymore. No, that's I'm kidding. I hope that you guys keep watching my videos either way. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you learned something. Please like, please subscribe if you haven't already. I am over 500 subscribers. Yes. Halfway to 1,000. We're getting there. Um, you know I have a Patreon. I'll put the link in my comments section. Uh, I love that you guys are supporting me like this. Thank you so much for watching my videos. If you want voice lessons, please let me know. I love teaching voice, and you guys know that. I already have several voice students that I picked up from this, and I'm sure that any one of them could kind of give you some 
ideas a review of how it goes and what they've learned so please reach out to me if you have any questions i'd love to help you as best as i can thanks for watching guys i will see you all next week take care bye